Hi everybody, my name is Kate Haley and I am here with Glazer's Camera today and this week to kick off PhotoFest, the virtual edition. Um, want to introduce just a, a message from one of our owners, Rebecca Kaplan. So check out this video from her about PhotoFest. Super glad you're here with us. My name is Rebecca. Welcome to PhotoFest Virtual Edition. We're super glad you're here with us. My name is Rebecca Kaplan, and I am one of the owners here at Glazers. When it became apparent that we were not going to be able to have PhotoFest the way we're accustomed to, we made the decision to transition and bring the event online. We've worked really hard. Our team has put together a great lineup of speakers throughout the week, and we are very excited to welcome you to participate in this new format. We are so grateful for the community who's been extremely supportive of us over these last number of weeks during the challenging times. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world. We'd also like to thank our team here at Glazers who put together an amazing studio so we can broadcast live and be on multiple platforms and create a high quality experience for all of you who are going to be tuning in. Throughout the week, our content is going to be streaming on YouTube and Facebook Live. Pretty much all of the sessions will be recorded, and so if you can't make it when they're happening live, they'll be available on YouTube after PhotoFest. We'd also like to thank our vendors who have been very supportive during this time as well. They have shown with the amount of support and the great content and the speaker lineup that we're able to provide this week their true dedication to local independent camera stores like Glazers. And we are very appreciative of all of the efforts they've gone through to help provide a really excellent lineup of speakers and presenters. We're going to be covering a variety of topics. Some of them are very timely in this moment. And thanks for being with us. We're really excited to, to see you. We will have people moderating the comments and the chats that will be coming in online engage with us. We're here to learn and to explore and be inspired together. Thanks so much. So thank you, Rebecca, for sharing that message with us. Um, we're, I just want to have, I have a couple more things to add to that. Um, today we kick off 24 sessions over the next eight days. So from today until uh, June 20th. We have a variety of topics from photography, including wedding and portrait photography, to um, lighting, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment, and so much more. So stay tuned for this. We are the questions, if you have questions or comments, please post those on YouTube or on the Facebook page where the live session is at. We're gonna be monitoring those and asking questions throughout each of the sessions. Um, many of these sessions will also be recorded and available on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. So if you missed a session, many of those are going to be available for you to watch down the line. Um, but today's first session, we're super excited and proud to announce Jonathan Thorpe. Uh, Jonathan is a cinematic photographer based in DC, and he's going to talk about his work and his approach. Um, and we're going to have a little bit of fun talking about Westcott FJ400s and probably some other lighting options. Um, and we also have uh, Brian, who is with Westcott, who will be kind of hanging out and may ask, answer some of the questions with us. So if you have questions during the session, please feel free to post those again on the YouTube chat or in the comments on the Facebook of our Facebook Live event. And we'll be monitoring and asking as many of those as we can throughout the session. So Jonathan, I'll let you kick it off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, First of all, before I you know get into this, just want to say thank you to Glazers and and Westcott for allowing this to happen. Um, you know everything's kind of crazy right now, so it's still cool that we can at least come together in some capacity and and teach and 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 share knowledge and and still be involved in you know photography communities and whatnot. And that's that's really cool. Uh, before I get into my presentation, I'll introduce myself a little bit more. My name is Jonathan Thorpe. I'm a commercial and portrait photographer based in Washington, DC. I've been a full-time photographer now going on 11 years. Uh, the funny story about me is before uh, being a photographer, I was actually an eye doctor um, for about a month before I quit to become a full-time photographer after one of my photos uh, got published in a random magazine. I just kind of took it and ran and it's been 11 years and it's been a great career. Um, my specialty as we kind of were talking about today is what I call cinematic photography or 
cinematic portrait or, you know, there's a lot of different words to it. It's all kind of based in a narrative though. Um, another fun fact is I don't know uh, how to take a natural light photo. I've never done it. Uh, when I first started in my career, I would, the way I taught myself lighting was I would take like GI Joe action figures and hold little flashlights around their heads. And that's how I taught myself lighting. And I would take those same principles with my friends and some, you know, crappy speed light that I got off eBay and just try to mimic those same ideas that I was doing with these little GI Joes or whatever. That's, that's where my love of lighting kind of began. I wanted to create images that were different enough that it would lend itself to being, you know, my niche and my style and never wanted to waver from that. And it was always difficult for me to figure out how to accomplish a different style using just natural light. So I always just, I just jumped in full bore uh, with lighting. And when you do that, you kind of approach photography in a different way. You kind of approach it in a way of a cinematographer. You're, you're using your light and your coloring and your, your, your locations as mood and atmosphere. And that's kind of what is important to me in my shooting. I want to create feeling and motion and, um, and, and emotion and moods in my shots, not necessarily just, you know, here's a, uh, a model on a fence, you know, everything has to have some base and narrative uh, for me to be excited about shooting it. So I'll go ahead and I'll show, I'll share this presentation. We're going to go through um, a fair amount of my work um, and how I lit, you know, each one of these photos and why it's lit that way, what my lens choice was and why I use that lens. You're going to notice I don't use a lot of uh, tight lenses. It's a lot of mid range to wide. Um, and we're going to start with one light and go all the way up to, I think the, the most lights I show in my presentation today is six lights total, all working together to form uh, one uh, exposure. So we'll get into it here. Uh, it's, I call it cinematic portraits. That's just the easy term for it, but we're, we're using light and lens here for storytelling. Um, what does that mean? So we're creating images, images that have a more narrative and cinematic feel Creating images that have a more narrative and cinematic feel comes down to using lens choice and lighting to create these feeling, mood, and emotion in your shots. Something I already kind of touched on. Uh, you know, as photographers, we need to be conscious of all the decisions we make in our photos, where the light hits, how it hits, what is modifying that light, and what the color is of that light. All those things play a role in creating an image that's more narrative than it is a snapshot or just a photograph. You know, editing and color also play a big role. However, I don't want to re rely on that when I'm shooting. Uh, I always have the the final product in the back of my mind, uh, but I don't want to go home and spend two hours editing a shot. I'd rather spend, you know, 10 hours of that week planning the shot if it saves me two hours of editing at home. Uh, I don't enjoy editing. I don't enjoy being in front of a computer. I want to be shooting. And because of that, it can make shoots a little bit more difficult, but it kind of pays off more in the end. Um, most of everything you'll see today, aside from I think two images, are not photoshopped. Everything is pretty much done in, in, in camera. There may be a tweak to contrast, or maybe a tweak to exposure here or there, but as far as changing the mood, changing color, changing, adding, uh, things to the photo to enhance it. None of that has been really done. There's been, you know, obviously skin touch up, but as far as what you see in my presentation today will be what my camera saw on the day of the shoot. Today, we're gonna look at what lenses I'm typically shooting with and how I light these images to create, in different ways to create different moods. Again, I'm gonna preach it a thousand times. To me, mood, atmosphere, feeling is the most important part of a photograph. Model kind of falls in there around the second, and then the location is probably the third. But I want to create something that is uh, relatable. I want to create something that invokes kind of a, a feeling in someone, obviously, because that's what that's what art is. Uh, but it also needs to kind of feel like it's pulled straight from a movie, or it's it's kind of an in between moment uh, in a movie, or something like that. So, what do I use to accomplish this? Well, it's always it's typically lighting. Uh, depending on the scene you're creating, typically two light sources are needed you know, add more to enhance those looks. One can be used, but if I use one light, I'm using usually typically using like a very broad light source. If I'm just using uh, one light into a shoot, uh, it's, for lack of a better term, it's kind of like cheating light. It's always gonna be pretty. Um, I don't mind a little bit of spill. I want it to feel kind of natural, even though it's still artificially lit. Uh, 
and you know it's just an easier to manage light than it is a hard just hitting uh, like a bare bulb or a really small modifier you know i just i tend to prefer medium to large uh modifiers modifiers play a big role in the final product too smaller as i just said smaller mods will create a more focused light while larger create a more uh broad pleasing light so whatever is good for your production use it uh in the last 11 years i've kind of narrowed my modifiers down to i use probably the same three or four on a continuous basis i don't like i'm not i get maybe i just, maybe i just don't care enough but i don't like study the light of all the modifiers i just i know it's going to work well on this photo and i'm going to use that modifier and that's going to be the one and just it works um i try to keep things as simple as possible a, uh, a wide to mid angle lens also helps in your story since it will help you show more of the location uh, than it does just the person. I typically shoot between 35 and 60. Uh, I think one image today has the 85 millimeter on it, has an 85 on it, but I typically stay between that 35 and 60 because I do want to show enough of the location that it lends itself to the narrative, but I don't want to show too much of the location that we lose a subject. And on the same hand, on the other hand, I don't want to show too little of the location that we don't that it doesn't matter uh, to the narrative. So mid-range lens, 35 to 50, 60, whatever, and then tons of light thrown all over the place. Um, where is this best used? Well, it's usually based location. Uh, I say this a lot, and I think it's very important that photographers kind of take this to heart. When you go into a shoot, out, at least outside of a studio, but you know we can throw studio shoots uh, into this as well. There's always going to be two subjects. There's your your actual subject who you're there to shoot. In this case, you know whatever portrait or whatever it is, and then there's the location is their second subject, and that has to have its own light, its own exposure, everything. So it has to be thought about uh, in layers. Um, I'm the son of a painter. My mother painted when we were growing up, and she would paint in layers. And you would lay your 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 background thing down first and kind of build up. So that being said, I always tend to light back to front. I don't ever really light my key or my, my, my subject until I've lit the whole room or lit the whole location first. And that way I can kind of create that mood in the room. And then it's just kind of lighting the, the subject. The mood is, is kind of set off by the location that the, the photo is taking place in. So I want to make sure that I get my light on that correct. Um, if I'm gelling anything, if I am just looking at shadows and things like that, the room is going to be the tricky part to light. When it comes to lighting a portrait, eh, it's you know you're going to use your 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 tried and true methods on that. But when you're lighting a location, you're lighting things to create um, a scene. That's where it starts to get really tricky. So when I go to a shoot, I'm going to get there you know two hours, three hours early, and just focus on lighting the location. That way, when my subject does show up, there's no variables. There's no like oh well, there's a weird shadow on the wall there. I can I know what the light already looks like in the room, and I can just put a light on them. And then my shoot's done in 15 minutes and they're out the door. Uh, I tend to work with some celebrities. I tend to work with, you know, high profile clients and speed is usually kind of the big deal. So if I can get my room lit, get a nice base exposure in the room, highlight certain parts of that location, whatever it may be, then it's much, much easier just to pull a subject in, fire off the shots, and then they can go. So we get into the first uh, shot here. This is all, these first six photos are all going to be with one light. Uh, I shoot with the Westcott FJ400. It's a fantastic strobe, high-speed sync. Uh, I, I couldn't even go into all the multitude of things it does because I'm, you know, it's just so many things. But it's a fantastic strobe, uh, and it has a universal trigger system with it where you can select whatever camera you're using on the trigger and fire it through the the Westcott FJ400, which is amazing for me because if I bring other photographers on a shoot and I'm shooting Canon, they're shooting Sony. Someone shooting an icon, I can just hand my trigger to each one of those people and they can just switch it to whatever camera manufacturer it is and they can still get the same light that I'm shooting with. So one light, often shot with a broad modifier and can incorporate other ambient light sources. We're gonna sh look at uh, shooting with no ambient light sources and then starting to mix in other parts of light, sunlight, room lights, lamps, things like that using just one light. Using off-camera flash is a very effective tool in creating these cinematic shots. Also, like I said, Incorporating the sun or other ambient sources often where creating that mood uh, comes from. Constant lights do work. Uh, I just prefer to work with strobes. And that's another thing. Everything I talk about today can be accomplished with any type of light. Uh, constant lights, uh, speed lights, any type of light emitting source. 
Uh, I just prefer strobes for their power and the recycle time, um, be able to modify them differently to create different types of looks with the, the quality of light. So for me, strobes are where it's at. But again, most of what I'm looking at, you're looking at today can be accomplished with any type of light source. So our first light here, go through this. There we go. So single light, no sources. This is just shot in my backyard uh, on my, my fence. I have a wooden fence that's in my backyard. Uh, this is shot on a Canon 6D, so not like the most revolutionary camera. Uh, it's a 35 millimeter lens. That's those wide angles that I like to work with. Strobe, as always, like I just talked about. The only time, this is a different modifier that I typically use is a Fotex soft lighter. Um, it's, a, it's a reflective umbrella that's very shallow and it creates a very kind of painterly, I hate to use that term, but kind of like a painterly look on the skin. So this is just one light. This is boomed just overhead at about 45 degrees. So it's kind of hitting her right in the forehead a little bit. And that's the only thing we're using in the shot. Now we used um, a fog machine. Well, it's, it's a can of fog spray. If you guys have ever seen that, I travel with these things constantly. I have a palette of them in my studio. I always have a can of fog spray because it helps create these type of scenes that are kind of ethereal and have kind of a mood and a feel to them. So we just sprayed a little bit of that in the shot, fired off a couple of quick uh, portraits, and this is what you're left with. Um, in post, I'm doing a little bit of skin touch up, and then I'm just bringing down the reds and bringing up the blues and greens to kind of give this cold feeling. So we went from just shooting a model on a fence to creating a scene that has some, some thought to it, has a feeling. We're using tonage to bring up, to make that feeling more evident. And then we're using a little bit of fog in our light to kind of create this ethereal, um, not creepy, but you know, a little creepy, uh, ethereal vibe to the, um, the whole shot. So we'll move on here. So this is a similar shot. Uh, Similar in the sense that it's the same type of light. It's another light that's boomed uh, right overhead. This time I'm looking at the Switch Beauty Dish um, through Westcott. And then what I'm really focused on in this shot is making sure that I see those lamp lights in the background. So when I'm firing off this shot, it's gonna be completely dark with no other sources being seen, just those lamps. And then I'm gonna start introducing my light. So that way we're, we're doing this balancing act with the ambient sources in the room and then my artificial off-camera light just to light her up. I shot this in Denver. I was there on another assignment, had some downtime, and I wanted to do something that would be kind of fun for my portfolio. So we met up in a hotel, my hotel room and shot this off. Uh, so basically, had the flash not fired, you're looking at a pretty much blacked out scene with just the, the lamp lights, and there's a little light above her head behind the bed there that was lighting up a little like curtain thing. Uh, and then I'm just, all I'm doing is basically filling in shadows at that point with my off-camera light so that I just see her face and then we don't, we don't lose any of those, those lamp and uh, ambient light sources that are behind her. Now I'm going to go through the one lights kind of quick um, because I would assume people want to see the multiple big light setup. So we're going to kind of go through these quick so we don't lose a lot of time. Strobe, outdoor, high-speed sync. This is taken at a motorcycle race in New Jersey. Um, it's classic cars, classic bikes, and you know that what goes along with that are like that leathery skin kind of guys who work in the garage and are you know just tough around the edges, or whatever. And I like to use really hard sources for these to bring out all those nooks and crannies and 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 textures and whatnot in their skin. So we're shooting this with high speed sync. That way we're still getting a beautiful blue sky behind them. Um, we're not losing. We're not just blowing out the sky. We're shooting at like one eight thousandth of a second here to make sure we don't lose that sky. This is high noon sun, the worst time you could possibly shoot. So we're getting, if you look to his left, we're getting a little bit of light here, uh, just from the sun that's hitting his side. And then we're just, again, we're gonna fill in those shadows with the light. We're using a switch octa here. This is a medium octa, octa bank. Travel with this thing all the time. Beautiful light source, beautiful quality of light, easy to pack up and down. And all I'm doing here is exposing for the background, which is a very, normal thing that all photographers do. We're always told to expose for your highlights, expose to the background, right? So I wanna make sure I'm getting that really, really rich blue sky. And I'm using just the ambient light, the sun essentially here uh, on the background for those cars and other people. And then I'm just wanna, cause you see that they're, they're silhouetted and that's what he would look like as well had I not just filled in the shadows on his face. So a lot of my lighting is basically just a, a dance with shadows. I'm filling in shadows all the time. And that's why I've decided to do the whole lighting from back to front thing. 
it's much easier to just fill in shadows that you see in a shot versus trying to find highlights for me. That's just how my brain works. So in this, we, I'm using a pretty hard light source. It's pretty close by. Uh, most of my shots, my, my uh, light sources and my modifiers are barely out of frame. And I'm typically just shooting right underneath them, pressed up against it. In this, the, the modifier is maybe a foot away from his head and I'm shooting just below it. And you know, it's a, it's a delicate dance, making sure it's not getting in the frame. But by keeping those modifiers very close to our subject, we start to see the, the effects of that modifier on the light, which is the reason that we're using modifiers to begin with. We wanna make sure we're seeing the actual effects of these modifiers and not just throwing light all over the place. So the closer you can get the light in, alternatively, it's also gonna be a little bit softer. Um, you start just to see the effects of that modifier. And that's what's also very important to me. Different modifiers produce different qualities of, uh, qualities of light and you should know what they do. So I always get my sources very, very close in, as, as close as I possibly can uh, without having to Photoshop out a corner of it here and there. And because of that, you get like these very, very rich kind of textured looking portraits too. So this is the one I said, I think I had one in my portfolio that was an 85 and this is the 85 here or 45, I guess. I guess I don't have any 85s in this. Um, so this is a, a very similar portrait to the last shot. The only difference being here that the sun is no longer straight overhead. It's more behind him. And we're using that as a rim light. If you look to his, uh, his right, our left, you see that sunlight kind of peeking in over the top of his ear right there. That's just the sun coming in. And I'm blurring out the background shooting at a really shallow depth of field. So I'm shooting this again in high speed sync using a very shallow depth of field, an F2 situation. So we get this quick fall off of blur uh, with his ears and whatnot. And that way his eyes just kind of stay sharp and everything else just blurs out. And all we're showing here is that the sun is acting as a rim light and giving our photo a little bit of dimensionality. We're not just shooting a flat portrait. Um, we all know sunrise, sunset are usually your best times to shoot, but I also don't want to sit there and shoot with a low sun uh, with the light directly in his face because that he's going to be squinting. And that's not what we're looking for. So we put the sun behind our subject that gives us a nice rim light on his back, shoulder, top of his hair, whatever. And then we're going to fill in the shadows once again on his face. And now that one light has become kind of a two light setup by using the sun as the ambient light. And it's just a balancing act at that point. So this is a single light outdoor cloudy. So cloudy is always kind of the best time to shoot outdoors. And as I said earlier, I don't know how to take a natural light photo. Um, even on a cloudy day when the light is soft and pleasing and it's, it's pretty impossible to take a quote unquote bad portrait, I'm still going to bring lights and I'm still going to shoot it the way that I shoot everything. This was taken in Idaho when they were having a ton of uh, fi wildfires that were going on in the mountain. If you look in the background, the reason it was so cloudy was smoke from the fires. And that's what that haze is on that mountain behind her. So had I exposed for that, we would just kind of lose the texture of the trees. And I wanted to make sure we saw those trees behind her. So we kind of grounded her even more. We see the dirt road, we see the taller trees that are in the foreground or in the direct background. But I wanted to make sure we could see past that. So this photo has a lot of depth to it. So we're just underexposing that background a little bit, just so we don't lose the texture of the trees and in, in the mix of the haze and the cloud. And then we're gonna again, just put a light directly overhead. Uh, this is boomed from very far away. It's like a 10 foot boom from her that I have an assistant holding. Um, so we don't have anything in the shot. We shot this kind of wide and I wanted to be able to show a full body. And then, you know, once you start shooting wide, you start to open up the ceilings to things and you start to see your modifiers. And it's, it's very, very close by. If you look at the top of her helmet, we can see that little burst of highlight that's hitting it. That just shows you how close that light source really is to her. And all I'm trying to do is just fill in the shadows underneath her face and mask and then letting the ambient light kind of dictate the rest of the shot. Very, very simple setup, uh, but it's it accomplishes something very cool and very uh, interesting to the narrative of you know this female firefighter who's been on this mountain for probably two weeks straight working, and we're just taking the portraits of the, uh, the firefighters. So single hard light, this is kind of a similar thing uh, to the photo of the gentleman at the motorcycle, at the, the race on the beach. The only difference here is I'm using a beauty dish and the beauty dish is gonna hit very, very hard and kind of expose 
every imperfection as well as perfection in someone's skin. It's typically used in beauty photography because it's such a hard light, but doesn't create a really, really uh, hard hot spot. So it's a hard light that fills up a source and comes out of it. So you do, you start to see every little detail in someone's skin, but it doesn't give you like one big burst of a hot spot in the center. Uh, this is just, I did a, a series of photos called parking lot portraits where I would sit up in a random parking lot and just hope someone would show up. And, you know, it was sometimes seven hours of just sitting out there hoping someone would be there. And finally, you know, people started to show up. And this gentleman came up and I just said, hey, I want to take your portrait. Had him stand under the beauty dish and we created this really cool, intense, almost chiseled light around his uh, cheekbones, around his face, and around his uh, beard and everything. And you can almost count each individual hair on his face. Uh, and that's just done by using light and using that very contrasty light that a beauty dish produces. Um, I don't use it that that much just because it is a pretty hard contrasty light. But for something like this, where I want to bring out all the, the features and textures of someone's skin, it works very, 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 very well. All right, so we're going to get into two lights now. This is where we start to get a little more complicated. But again, if we just think about we're just managing sources and we're just managing shadows, highlights, things like that, then it starts to get a little bit easier to think about. So adding another light can help with your storytelling in lots of different ways. The second light can be used as a rim, background, room light, whatever you got. Balancing these different levels of flash output will also add some dimensionality to your photos. So we'll get right into it here. So two light sources, it's, it's kind of a, a first and secondary thing in my book. Um, I'm always gonna light back to front still, even if it's just a person, meaning I'm gonna get my rim light first. I wanna see how the light is hitting their, sh their shoulders or the side of their head or their hair, any of those things. Cause that's where it starts to become a thought out process. Meaning you are using lights in a different way, not just to light your subject's face and go, but you're using lights to help separate them from a background, you're using lights to help uh, tell your narrative, you're using lights to create some type of feeling, uh, almost like stage light, that kind of that kind of vibe to stuff. So when you're using two lights, it's, you just, people, people panic. I don't know where to put the light. I don't know how bright it should be. I don't know. And there's no real rhyme or reason or scientific thing for this. It's just what you feel works best. Uh, in this first photo, this could easily be shot with one light and it would be fine. But what I did was I added another large, so I'm using a large octobank to light her uh, face and her left shoulder, her left shoulder, our right shoulder on the screen. And I'm just bringing up those shadows on the other side with another large parabolic. And all that's doing is just giving a tiny bit of light uh, to her shoulder and her neck there. And it, what it does is the shadow that's created by the first light underneath the, the, um, the jawline, I'm going to put a little bit of light there just so it gives even a harder shadow and it really chisels that jaw. Now, can this be done with reflectors? Absolutely. I could put a, a, a V flat next to her and fill in those shadows with a reflector. I just don't have access to that stuff. You know, if I'm on set, if I'm outside, um, I don't want to rely on a giant piece of cardboard that's going to blow over every time the smallest breeze comes by. So I'll use my lights as the same idea. So basically that second light that we see as that rim that is basically acting like a reflector. It's the power on it's very, very low. It's just filling in a tiny bit of shadows on her side as opposed to just setting up um, a, a V flat or a reflector. And this is shot in studio, so it could easily be a V flat, but I've kind of just taught myself to use my lights in different types of ways, meaning I can use my light to look like it was shot with a reflector. I can use lights to look like they were just shot natural lit, um, different ways like that. So I just rely on my lights as opposed to, you know, dragging out reflectors or assistance or whatever else. Um, sometimes you don't have the budget. Sometimes you don't have the time to bring other people on set. So it's good to have that bag of tricks that you still know how to make shots look a certain way, even you know you're even though you're using uh, off camera light. So that was two large uh, soft lights on that, two large sources. We're gonna get into what I call one soft, one focused. Um, and this is also a very subtle way of lighting things to create, um, I call it lighting with purpose. So in this shot, this is a sunflower field uh, up in Maryland. Um, it's probably, you know, six o'clock in the afternoon, this was taken. 
So we have a nice low sun, but the sun was getting so low that it was kind of just hitting only the flowers and it wasn't really getting over the top of the flowers to hit our, to hit our model here. So what I'm doing is it's kind of hard to see because this is, for whatever reason, this got cropped to a, a portrait in my presentation as opposed to a, a, a landscape and it's a, normally a landscape shot. But just to the right corner of this is the sun. That's what's coming into the shot, but it wasn't hitting her hair. So I put up another light, just a bare bulb uh, right behind her to give a little bit of light to her hair to make that sun uh, more of a believable light source to the shot. And that, that might be kind of hard to explain. There's another photo in my portfolio or my presentation today that will explain it a little bit better that we'll get to in a second. But I'm just creating um, light, uh, I don't know, a, effect on the person that would be there had we just been shot naturally. Um, lighting with purpose, using uh, ambient influences on your subject is very important because it helps create uh, a believable image. Again, does it need to have that little bit of glow on the hair right there? Probably not. It would still be a beautiful portrait without it, but having that little bit of light in her hair just lends it to this whole feeling of low sun late in the day. The color of the sky, you know, low sun late in the day. So let's make everything come together to really hit this idea home to what this portrait really is. So it's a small octobank that's boomed overhead. I use a C stand and boom for 99.9% .9 of my portraits. It's not fun dragging a C stand around. It's heavy. I got sandbags everywhere, but I like to be able to use a, a sturdy stand that's going to withstand any type of wind. And I want to be able to boom it overhead at the same time because I'm using a boom always. As we talked about, I'm shooting directly underneath these light sources. I need them to be as close to the subject as possible. So in this, it's boom right over her head. I have her chin up just a little bit so she can, her face can catch all that beautiful light. Um, and then a simple bare bulb just behind her uh, hitting the top of her hair. Again, it's very simple, um, but it helps just ground the photo and make it a little bit more uh, believable. So this photo, I've talked about this photo a ton of times um, because as much as I like this portrait, uh, this photo was done completely wrong. And typically if I was giving this presentation in person, I would be asking everyone like, hey, what do you think is wrong? And what do you think is wrong uh, with the shot? So, I mean, if anyone wants to chime in right now while I'm talking about it, feel free to throw into the questions what you think is wrong with it and then we'll kind of get there. So I just said it with the last photo, lighting uh, with purpose. Um, this shot was taken in Vegas. I was there speaking at WPPI. And you know, whenever I travel for anything, I try to uh, take some time to do my own shoots and create portfolio images and whatnot, or just, just take pictures, you know? We walked down uh, Fremont Street and we came upon this old uh, gas station. And I, I, I had talked to the model here beforehand, set that whole shoot up or whatever. We found this old gas station with this old car sitting underneath these really interesting uh, lights. And it was just kind of a cool scene. So we wanted to kind of uh, bring out the, 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 the way this whole shot looked. So I had her pose and because I was traveling and whatever, I just, I just had speed lights with me in this, on the shoot. And I put it into a small soft box and I have a bare bulb uh, speed light. So the reason why I say that this photo is quote unquote wrong, if we look at our shot, and we look at the, the ambient sources that are present. We see that we have a, a greenish hue to one back here and we have a white one up here. We look at the car, we see that there's a giant reflection across the, the windshield and across the hood. But then we look at her and we see that the lighting on her doesn't really match uh, what's happening around her as a, you know, in regards to the overhead light. We have to kind of let our brain fill in the blanks a little bit. So if you look at the pattern of lights above her, you know, there's one back there, there's one over here, over here. There's likely one almost directly over her head in the scene and one a little bit further up toward me where I'm shooting. So we get this really odd highlight on her, her right side, our left side looking at the screen. Whereas that highlight should probably be on the other side to match how bright the influence is above her on the windshield and hood. That's where that hard, highlight should be coming from then the other light source should be lighting the other part of her body if that makes any sense at all and i'll try to explain it a little bit clearer 
I just feel like the highlight that we see on her arm right here down down the hood of the car needs to be on the other side of her arm as opposed to where it is to make the light in the uh, location more believable and more accurate to what the those lights would be influenced in the photo like. Uh, I still like the picture and it's very nitpicky of me to, to even point that out, I know, but if we're selling something, a selling an image, selling a narrative, selling a story, we should probably pay a little bit closer attention to how those light sources are affecting our subject and the ambient light sources on location. Okay, so this time we are turning two lights into three. So we're still using two lights, but in this case, we're using it in the sense that those two lights now look like there are three lights because we see three versions of highlights on either side of her face and then one uh, light in the front. We're shooting this through a seven foot parabolic with um, a diffusion uh, panel on it. And that's, that's my background, that's directly behind her. And we're shooting that straight to the camera. And by doing that, it's gonna give this beautiful wrapping light around your face. It's really, pardon me, it's really tricky uh, shooting with a light source that harsh, not harsh, but that bright to the camera, but you, you mess with your camera setting and you kind of figure it out. Um, so with just that source hitting, you get a really dark shadow down the center. In this case, we're using a beauty dish, uh, just boomed overhead again. We can see the catch lights in the eyes to see where that, that light source is sitting. And we're just gonna fill in the shadows of that beauty dish. And then we're gonna rely on that background to create those two beautiful highlights around her face. It kind of makes beauty photography a little easier. This could be done with you know, a, curtain, uh, a shower curtain, a white sheet, anything like that. This as long as you're shooting it at the camera through that diffusion, you get this beautiful wrapping light around someone. So it turns a two light setup, I'm sorry, it turns a three light look out of a two light uh, setup. Really basic, really easy stuff. Okay, so there's another photo where I would ask everyone to kind of tell me where they think this was shot. Um, I get a lot of different answers about what this photo looks like and what's actually happening. In this case, we're using our lighting not even to necessarily uh, light our subject, but we're using it to create some type of drama in the shot. And we're using it as a, a, a tool as opposed to just lighting you know, our scene. Uh, this was taken during a blizzard in DC a couple years ago. Uh, it is a a ballerina, obviously, and that is actual snow that we see falling around her. Um, when I've shown this photo in the past, I get a lot of different answers of that looks like it was shot on a stage and you know those looks like stage lights and stage lighting. This is actually shot on one of the busiest highways in the DC area during this blizzard. We pulled over and all those lights you see behind her are headlights from cars and street lights and things like that. Uh, and we shot this pretty quick. We set up a bare bulb strobe behind her and then uh, another strobe boomed overhead of her just to kind of bring up some of her shot. I didn't want to see her full you know, body. I just, didn't want, I just didn't want to see a silhouette. But in this, that background light is giving us all that really interesting snow. And that's what's really cool about the shot. You know, We want to see that snow falling. So we use that as a, we use a background light to bring up the snowfall. And then again, it's, she's kind of secondary for me in the shot, meaning, yeah, it's great that there's a ballerina there in this position, but I really wanted to show that that snow was falling around a person. And then you see just a hint of her dancing. You kind of just have to look a little bit deeper into the photo uh, to figure out what's really happening. And that's what's kind of cool about the shot. Uh, we get these cool shadows coming straight to camera, which is pretty typical of a theater or stage light. And I'm basically just bringing that theater stage light to a location outside during a snowstorm. Um, can be a really cool shot, can look really cool when you're using uh, the elements, rain, snow, that kind of thing. Um, and we're doing it, just throw a light out there and make sure it's coming straight to camera and you'll start to bring out all those texture uh, and details in the, the falling, whatever, rain, snow, dust, fog, any of that stuff, just backlight it and you'll see it really uh, clearly in your photos. So again, we're using our second light this time uh, um, to uh, create something in the shot. In this case, it's a fake sunlight. If you look just over her shoulder and behind, we see a bit of a glow coming into camera. Uh, this day we shot this, it was cloudy enough to where the sun would be blocked for like 15 to 20 minutes at a time. 
And honestly, we just kept getting annoyed with waiting for the sun to peek out. So we wanted to have that little burst of light to kind of hit home this like summer summertime portrait or whatever you want to call it. So we just eventually just put up a light and did it ourselves. We gelled a light a little bit warm. In this case, it was just a speed light that we gelled behind that was, you know, triggered IR with the um, the sensor or the, um, whatever you call it, the little, the thing that reads the light, <laughs> it was triggered with that. And we're just using that as a, as a quote unquote fake sunlight. We want a little bit of flare coming into the camera. We want a little bit of flare over the shoulder. And we're just throwing that light uh, behind and aimed at the camera and just letting it feather off to the side a little bit so we can catch a little bit of light uh, from the source. And it just gives us this kind of warm, you know, late day feel uh, because we just, we got tired of waiting. Like we had a, a deadline, we had an hour long uh, permit to take this photo and we just couldn't get the shot we wanted. And, and I keep preaching it. I don't want to sit down and edit that in. And it's, it's not hard to edit that in. It's hard to get these highlights that are believable on the shoulder. It's hard to get the highlights in the hair and the hat. That's tricky to get in post. Um, but, you know, just throwing a light up and getting those highlights naturally with, with what you're shooting on set, it takes five seconds. You know, it's much, much quicker. It's believable. It's real. And it's just an easier uh, narrative to tell. So this is what I call a fog influence on this shot. Um, this is a newer photo I've done. Uh, this is actually for a, believe it or not, a hair competition um, where we had to create these editorial images for a, a hair brand called Wella. Uh, Wella does a trend, it's called Trend Vision. It's a big uh, competition every year. I've won it, uh, I, think, I think just once I won and I've placed every other year since. And when I say a fog influence, I'm using that fog spray again in this shot. This is what I used in my very first portfolio image or my very first presentation image. And all I'm doing with that fog spray is light is spraying it around the lamp that we see behind her, right? And I'm just, by doing that, it creates this kind of glow haze coming from the lamp. Now that lamp is not anywhere near bright enough to give me that really beautiful highlight on her hair. So that's being taken with a, uh, a small strip box just off to the camera, uh, a Westcott small, it's like a, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong, I think it's a one by two. It's a little, it's a little guy, one by two, right? Yeah, one by two. Uh, that's Jeff just off camera. And then again, if you guys haven't guessed it, it's gonna be a C stand boomed overhead with a small octa um, just to light her up. Uh, and by hitting that light on her hair and then hitting a little bit of fog on the ambient lamp, you start to get the influence of that lamp on the hair and it becomes a believable photo. Otherwise you just have a, a lamp that's just there. And we don't want just a, a boring lamp just in the shot, right? We want it to be turned on. We want to get some type of influence from it. And what you do that is just by using that little bit of fog, creates a cool little hazy look in the lamp, which then is influencing the uh, artificial light in the shot. And it all kind of comes together and it feels believable. The only thing that bugs me about it is I wish I had my strip box a little bit taller to hit the top of her head a little bit more because that's kind of basically where that lamp is aiming directly at. But, you know. It still is a believable shot. For me, still happy with it. Um, and it has this kind of 1970s vibe to the whole thing. Whew, it's hard talking a lot. <laughs> All right, three lights. Three lights are more, right? This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, using three or more allows the photographer the most flexibility in creating an exposure in the scene. Uh, using this many lights gives you the ability to light large rooms, scenes or use maximum lights to bring out details in your subjects and sculpt them with light. Excuse me a second. So why are we using so many light sources? Well, lighting different parts of a location, lighting groups of people, lighting um, just anything as you see. And it jumps in pretty quick to like a pretty dynamic looking shot here. Uh, light is a really interesting thing to work with in the sense of it can completely transform every photo you have by just like like a five foot move, like just moving a light from here to here will completely transform every photo in your portfolio instantly. And it's kind of neat that, you know, you can get those, those type of things with just moving a light around. So I tend to, my typical portrait, if I'm going on location and I need to do, you know, my cookie cutter shot, 
is a minimum of four lights on one person. And what that is, is one light boomed overhead, two lights boomed on either, or two lights either side, and maybe one light on a background or one light uh, up high, down low, hitting the back of their head. For me, that creates a really interesting portrait. It creates a portrait that has some dimensionality to it. It has highlights, has a lot of cool shadows, and it just becomes a very, excuse me, interesting commercial um, editorial look. So we get right into this first shot. Uh, for those who are in your 30s-ish who are watching this, uh, this is the band Real Big Fish. Um, I have a background playing in ska bands, which is like the nerdiest thing about me. And these are some good friends of mine. And I was really, really excited to take this photo when I got hired for it. It's a pretty dynamic scene as far as exposures go. Um, but it's, it's very, very basic, okay? And we're gonna start again back to front in all these shots. So the first light that I'm setting up, well, the first, I guess, thought when I get on set for a shot like this is we have this beautiful storm that's about to roll through and I wanna make sure we see those clouds. So the very first exposure is a silhouetted building in clouds without the band in it in a darkened alley. So I get that exposure and that's where I wanna keep the camera set for the rest of the shot. I'm just gonna manage different levels of light to create my scene. The next uh, light uh, is going to be aimed directly at the building corner. And that light's gonna hit the corner and go in both directions down both sides of the building. That light is directly behind Johnny, which is the guy in blue right here. That's on a stand and he's just blocking the stand to camera, okay? So that light hits. So without anyone in the scene at this point, we have our cool clouds and we have our building lit up, okay? After that, the next light is also behind the band and it's behind uh, Matt and uh, Aaron right here, which is the white jacket and the striped jacket. That's directly behind them and that's aimed directly at the camera. And that's just another bare bulb. And that's gonna give us those shadows that are coming forward. Again, that's that, that stage light, that theater light that we're looking to create. And you can look at our, the shadows on the ground and it tells you exactly where that source is coming from. We get those two lights. And we also see like, um, some rim lights here on the side of their faces, in their hair, in their ear right here, right here on the top of his head. So all those sources, are, all, all those highlights are being produced by that same source that is causing the shadows uh, to the camera. We get both of those lights set and we're, we're, we're doing well. So now I need to light the band up. And I use a very large seven foot parabolic on a boom and that's boom directly over their head. And I'm literally, I remember this day, clear as day, like I'm, the boom is like bending to my camera lens, right? Like I'm really pushed up against it. I'm shooting this wide, I'm at 24 millimeters. So I'm really close to the band. We're getting that cool uh, exposure of the sky. We're seeing the location all at the same time. And it's just this one frame and that's it. Uh, in post, all I'm doing is, I think there was like a, a, a stand, a lake from the stand down here that I had to Photoshop out or clone stamp out, but that was it. And the rest of the scene is all done in camera. Um, so we're managing three separate light sources to create one scene. And it's kind of complicated, like I said, but if you think about, and I, I encourage photographers to do this, to think about things back to front, light your scene and then start bringing your lights forward into where the subject would be. It makes it way more, it makes it simpler for me at least to understand. Um, it's just like painting, you layer, you lay things down in layers as you, as you go. In this we're using three lights to help sculpt our face. Uh, Really, really simple. This is a my pretty much like I said, like my go-to light setup. Uh, it's a small deep octa that's going directly overhead, and that's going to shoot like a channel of light down her face, which is going to create these really hard shadows on either side. And then I'm going to bring in two small strip boxes on either side to fill in those those highlights, while maintaining that little strip of shadow. So you have almost three separate areas of highlight, and then that shadow is kind of going to frame her face a little bit around it. And I made those, those glasses that morning. I'm very proud of those glasses. I still have them and I wear them. <laughs> All right, gels. I'm going to, oh, 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 there we go. Gels. I'm going to say right now, and this is a controversial opinion. I hate gels. I hate using gels. Gels are real hard to use. I am not a good enough photographer to be good with gels. I don't know what it is. I don't know why I struggle with gels, 
but I struggled them. And in my entirety of my career, this is the only photo I've ever taken that the gels worked. Couldn't tell you why I'm bad at it. I'm just bad at it. Um, in this, we have the, we're going for like the eighties, you know, uh, the movie drive kind of vibe to things. So we're doing the purple and the blue gels, which everyone does. And it's just a hard thing for me to use. And we're using the, the fog spray again on the headlights to so get that cool glow. Um, and it's just, it's like a bank robber vibe. And that's why we use the gels. I really think this is the only time I use gels in my whole portfolio. Um, I just struggle with gels. And if, for those of you out there who have used gels, I think you'd struggle, you've struggled with them before in the past too. Uh, I just don't have the patience to deal with learning how to shoot gels. I don't know. I don't know why it's so hard. I, I, I don't know. Whenever I have to use gels, I feel like I suck as a photographer immediately because I just don't do well with gels. But whatever, we all get there. So it's just, it's two lights on either side. Uh, we obviously can see those light sources because of the colors of the lights. We see the pink on the one side, we see the blue on the other side. Um, and then we're just booming a, a beauty dish overhead to bring up their faces, and letting that light, light fall off pretty quick. So it just creates a, a natural vignette to the whole scene. I'm gonna go through these a little quick so we don't run out of time here. Um, okay, so this is a really interesting shot because I get a lot of questions about this because everyone asks me if this is a composite and it is not a composite. This is a one exposure shot. Uh, we got kind of lucky on the sun in the sky that day. This is shot in Savannah, Georgia. I was there on a shoot for South Magazine and I actually shot all the portraits for the entirety of an issue. So it was, I think 40 portraits shot in the span of two and a half days. It was brutal. It was a lot of running around the city and they were all location-based portraits. They're all narrative shots like this. And when I tell people about this and then there, how we had all these lights out in the middle of the street without, you know, permits, I mean, this is all kind of run and gun stuff. How'd you do it? How'd you make this shoot happen? Clearly you shot this in the studio because there's no way you could blah, blah, blah. If you travel with a traffic cone in your car, you can do anything. People just listen to traffic cones. It's the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen in my life. I just put a cone in the street and people just were like, oh, they're supposed to be there. And they would just drive around me and continue on their on their day. And it never was an issue. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying put a traffic cone in your kit, but traffic cones are really, really a useful tool when you're shooting this type of stuff. Uh, in this, we have two uh, strip boxes on either side. This is my typical three light setup. The only difference here being I'm using a three light setup on purpose because I want that sun influence over his back uh, on him. And I wasn't getting the highlights that I needed just using a one light. So we brought in two lights to help emphasize that wrapping sunlight coming forward. Um, if you look closely, and this is, again, I get really nitpicky about stuff. We see the light source from the sun bouncing off of the window of the theater. He owns this theater. That was the whole reason for this portrait. So the light on his right side, on his hand side, is just a tiny bit brighter than the light on his left side. And I did that on purpose because if we squint at this and we look at it, you know, with different types of eyes, we see a source of, from that window that would be hitting him. So I want to make sure we get a little bit brighter on that side than it is on the other side. That is the most nitpicky uh, waste of time probably. But to me, it's those little things that I like, my little Easter eggs in my photos that I appreciate that no one else will ever notice, but it's just my little thing. Okay, now we're on to four lights. And this is using three lights on the subject and one light as a practical. Um, this is Rhett and Link. They run the YouTube channel, Good Mythical Morning. One of the most successful YouTube channels out there. Um, I don't even know how many millions of subscribers they have, but they're, you know, they're doing very well. We shot this in a movie theater and we wanted to have, this is on their tour. They were doing a, a, a comedy tour. So we want to have this theater kind of vibe to it. Going back to the last shot, this is a very similar light setup with three lights, two on either side of them. You can see their, their highlights hitting right here on their side of their faces. Um, a large octobank that's boomed overhead. And then I'm throwing a light way in the distance coming straight to camera to act as if it was the projector in the movie theater. That light from back there is gonna give a cool um, hair light on the top of their heads. It's also gonna fill in a little bit of the shadows that are created by the, the, the rim lights. Um, and it's gonna give the photo a, a more, again, a more believable thing. We're lighting with purpose. We're lighting, we're using our lights in a practical way to help tell our narrative and tell uh, our story of the image. 
if we see them sitting in an auditorium or a movie theater like this, our brain almost wants to see that projector light because that's the only time we're ever in a theater, right? Is when a movie's playing in this situation. So we want to see that anyways, like our subconscious is telling us there should be a movie playing. So I want to add that light back there to make it just, just to hit that whole idea uh, home for the photo. All right. Oh, wait, this is a scary looking photo. I should probably preface that before I just fire into it. Um, I do these shoots for Halloween every year. Uh, it's my favorite photos I do. Uh, I throw a bunch of money into it. It's a, usually a big budget production. And the only reason I do it is just for fun. And it's just my turn to, to do something outside of client work. Uh, really quick, it's extremely important to do personal work. Uh, shoot things you care about. Shoot projects you care about. It'll make you a better working photographer if that's the route you want to go in life. But I really enjoy doing these Halloween shoots. So there's a lot happening in this shot, right? There is children, there is uh, flashlights, there's a monster, there's fire on the ground. Uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a tent in the left side of the, of the, of the shot too. Um, that, so first of all, that monster is a, a girl who drove up from North Carolina to DC who was seven foot one to play that monster in the shot. And we had that costume 100% made from scratch uh, from a costume place in Nashville for her to wear for this photo. And I remember talking to her about it, like, hey, we're not going to see your face. There's really no reason for you to be in it. She said, I just want to be in it. I don't want to be in a monster. I want to be in a monster. So she came up. When I get to really complicated light setups like this, it's very easy for my brain to get overwhelmed with what I think is important. And we're managing five sources here. What helps me get through these type of things is focusing on one um minuscule if you say it that way uh, element to the shot in this i wanted to make sure no matter what happened in the photo in my eyes it would be a successful shot if i could see the beams of light from the flashlights that's all i cared about it's all i wanted to do everything else was secondary at that point and when i focus on one little um one little aspect of a shot like that then it's much easier for me to let everything kind of just fall together from there so go over the lighting kind of quick here. Uh, we have three large parabolic umbrellas. These are six foot umbrellas. Those are all boomed straight up and down just to give my uh, base exposure of the woods. Okay, so this is shot middle of the night, completely pitch black, nothing else happening besides my lighting. So I'm just wanna get a base exposure. That base exposure is pretty low though. That being said, it's probably two or three stops under what it should be, okay? We then have a light directly um, behind in the woods coming straight to camera. I tend to do that a lot because I'm going to use fog in this as well. Uh, as you see those beams of light from the uh, flashlights, those are real. That's from the fog that's on set. And there's like a haze of light uh, behind the, the monster and whatever like that. Now, the only time I did Photoshop something in this was the fire. I wasn't comfortable having a, a legit fire burning on set with children, uh, with just, just everything. I don't know anything about fire. I don't want to burn down in the woods. So all I did was I put a bare bulb strobe where the fire would be, and I put a warming gel on that, fired that up at the children, and then in post, I replaced it with a, an, an image of fire. That warming gel light that I put there makes this shot 100% believable at that point. And it's those little things that create these cinematic shots, these these narrative portraits, right? There's a lot of things happening in this and it's kind of hard to see probably in this presentation, but the, the comic book that they're reading has the same monster on it. And that comic book we made for the shot, right? We did the whole thing because we wanted this photo to feel as if it was their imaginations sneaking up on them. And they're like so entranced in this scary comic book in a campsite, you know, just kids camping that it's kind of like you hear the, the sound in the woods, like, oh, what's that, what's that? And your brain instantly goes to like, well, it must be the monster we're reading about, right? So that was like the huge play on this image. Um, but having, again, going back to lighting, having that little bit of, of warm glow on, their, on the underside of their chins and faces just hits it home that this is a shot that was just lit by a fire, right? But that would never look like that. And to get your exposures to work, would be really, really tricky, right? You'd have to expose way slow on your shutter speeds um, to get the influence of fire on someone's face, especially from that distance away. 
So in this, again, we're using that, that fifth light as a quote unquote practical, meaning it's helped tell our narrative, but it's not necessarily a light that is pretty. It's not a light that is um, being used to, to, you know, I don't know, just it's not a light being used on the subjects for the reasons of making them look better. It's helped tell the narrative. All right, six lights, it's a lot of lights. Um, and I'll try to explain this as easy as I can. So this is a bowling alley portrait. I've been wanting to do one of these for a very, very long time. There is a behind the scenes video of this whole shoot that goes in pretty detail about why, what this whole thing is and how it came together. You know, we're managing a cast of, I don't know, really quick, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, like 15 people roughly. We have wardrobe being brought in. We have hair and makeup for everybody. Um, the location itself, there's a bunch of different things happening here. So if we were to take this photo with no lights at all, right? Just a natural lit exposure. The only thing that's gonna really be seen is that menu board back here. That's all I really cared about. For the rest of the shot, I'm lighting everything else. So we'll start back to front. And I have this listed backwards meaning I, I typed my key light on the, on the description first, but we'll, we'll start from the bottom and go up. So that sixth background light is just to bring up the shadows of that back concession area. That is a bare bulb light, spilling light, no reflector on it, just spills light everywhere and that just brings up the concession area. Moving forward from there, we have two bare bulb strobes on either side. You can see the light on the girl on the left-hand side hitting the side of her face and the photo's cropped a little tight, but on the other side, there's a tiny little hint of light um, bouncing off the hair on the other side of the shot. And those are, so we're, at, we're already at three lights. One on the background, so just hitting the concession area. We'll take a step forward. We have two more lights coming both sides like this. And those are also bare bulbs, okay? And that's just lights, that's helping light the room, light the people. And again, look at your highlights, look at your shadows. That'll always reveal your sources. We see these bright spots, that means there's a source just out of, out of the shot. We take another step forward. Now we have two strip, uh, strip boxes on either side, because I want those, those sources to be a little bit softer than that hard light hitting in the, in the far background. And that's gonna light our, our, our girls right here on the side of him. So we see their, their light in their hair, right? That also is gonna spill a little bit onto, his name's Ben, by the way. It's also spilling a little bit onto Ben. So we're, we're using these two sources to light three people as rim lights. Cool. Finally, we're booming a very large uh, deep parabolic overhead. That light is gonna be for Ben and it also is gonna spill out onto the two girls around him. Those are the girls who are just completely infatuated with the hometown hero bowler, kind of like a kingpin uh, vibe to the shot. Um, and that light just spills out onto them. Okay, so six lights, we'll do it one more time. One for the concession, and that's just a bare bulb. Two more uh, up from there on either side, those have seven inch reflectors on them. Those are just gonna help fill light in so we don't just have dark areas anywhere in the shot. Uh, after that, we have two strip boxes on either side of the, the, the main character females. That light is also spilling onto Ben, who is the principal in the shot. And then that large uh, deep parabolic is overhead. That's gonna light Ben's face as well as the other two female faces. This is one exposure, no editing, done out of the camera. The whole shoot was like two hours, but in that, or probably three hours, but in that span of three hours, probably 10 actual physical minutes of shooting. The rest of it was staging, uh, test shots, a ton of test shots, and uh, make sure wardrobe and makeup and everything were completed. All right, so we'll do this really quick. This is, we're getting to the end here. Um, composite shots. I do a lot of composite work that does play a role nowadays. Uh, clients want to be able to do anything and sometimes permits are too expensive and the budgets don't work. So you, we shoot composites, right? Three light setup is really good for compositing. When you have those two beautiful glows on either side and that one light overhead, you can then kind of put them in any scene. As long as you know the scene that they're going to go into uh, before you shoot it, you can then light it to kind of match those scenes. So uh, I apologize, this looks a little pixelated. I had to pull this off of a, a magazine article that the photo was in. This is my makeup artist, Jesse. Um, and I had shot this background plate, I think in West Virginia somewhere. 
And in the shot, we had this really cool light that was coming through from a back window there that was just kind of hazy and spilling into the frame. So I knew that if I was going to put someone into this composited shot, that I would have to have some type of wrapping light to match that background light. And that's what we've done here. So she's, uh, in addition to makeup, she's an MMA fighter. So we wanted this really tough kind of like muscle shot. Um, so we have her pose in a very strong way. We're using the location to help influence our, our studio light. We're shooting this on, you know, just a, a studio psych wall that I have. And then we're putting them together and it's creating one cohesive looking image um, that's pretty, you know, it's not fully believable, but for a shot that's dynamic like this, it's kind of expected not to be a full on uh, portrait shot location. So the compositing works very, very well uh, for a shot like this. On to the next one. This is also uh, the same project I was on in Savannah with the gentleman in front of the movie theater. We did run out of time, so we had to end up compositing some of the images. Um, one of the stories is about this young man who is one of the youngest, I'm going to get this wrong, one of the youngest film directors to be nominated for, I forget the award, a, a very prestigious award. And he grew up making films uh, in his childhood bedroom. So I had my assistant run out and get that film projector, which actually works. That light coming from the actual projector is the real light being projected out of it. Uh, we have three lights again, two on either side, one boom overhead. And then I found this, this picture of a, a bedroom that kind of worked with the whole scene and worked really well for telling the narrative of the shot. We were going to shoot this in his old childhood bedroom. Um, when we got to the house that was approved for the shot and we talked to the owners and we got there, they just were not into the idea of us shooting there anymore. So we had to kind of just improvise. And we just shot this in a local coffee shop on a blank wall that was nearby. And then I just composited everything else uh, together in post. And finally, uh, this is a shot of a local uh, DJ. Uh, I think this, and if anyone knows out there, let me know, but I think I was in Hong Kong when I shot that background bridge. I think that's Hong Kong. Um, but it had this really cool, like futuristic Tron blue light emitting from it. So I knew that it would look work well with the DJ, the whole electronic music vibe for everything. So again, that same three light setup, two lights on either side, one light overhead, really creates a dynamic portrait, really brings out cool features of the face and cheekbone and really sculpts them out of scenes. And we also have all these beautiful light uh, uh, influences in the shot, the light from the bridge, the light from the overhead. So it all kind of works together to create that cohesive image that's very believable and you know isn't your typical just composite thing, right? I've done multiple composites where I have 20 people in the frame and we're, we're locking the camera down on a tripod and we're lighting each individual uh, group with the same lights, but all over the same scene. And it's really easy when you start to learn composite work, how it all kind of comes together as long as you're matching, you know, uh, focal lengths and things like that. But for just a clean, quick, you know, he needs to make a poster, needs to do something, shooting something like this is, is really, really a simple thing to do. And that is my last shot. And I can't breathe because I've been <laughs> talking forever. So. That was awesome. <laughs> what was that? I said that was awesome. Did you expect to talk that long without taking a breath? <laughs> that was a lot. That was a lot. So yeah, we can get into questions. Uh, whatever you want to do, I can stop the share. You tell me. Here's a question. Okay. Is there a question? Uh, yeah, if you, if, do you have, well, uh, we, we actually don't have a ton of questions. The, the chat has been a little okay. bit more quiet than I thought it would be. Um, okay. But we did have one, um, one person kind of early on was asking how you, how you meter. Um, so when you're composing your shots, you know, where do you meter your light? So it looks like it's probably going to vary from different different setups and that yeah. kind of thing. But um, totally. Do you want to totally. talk about this? Um, maybe I don't how own you a light meter. <laughs> um, I probably should. I've never used one. Uh, it's it's really kind of a trial and error thing. Over time, you start to know what your lights are going to do, though, and it kind of just becomes a second nature. Um, what's important is I usually just set my aperture to where I, where I know I want it to be, and that's typically a, between a two eight 
and uh, F8. It's somewhere in that realm usually, which is you know not surprising. Um, shooting with a a larger depth of field is pretty cool for me because I want to be able to show everything in the shot. Um, and then it's just it's a little bit of trial and error. I wish there was a more scientific answer to your question, but you just you start to just know you start to know what lights need to do and, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, definitely over time, it's one of those, the more you shoot, the more comfortable you get. You know, I have my go-to headshot set up and I know where that light's going. Yeah. I know the power for the light. I know my camera settings, just set it up and go. So, um, but for some of those more complicated shots, there's a little bit more time and planning that goes into that to make that happen, of course. Totally, totally. Um, I, you know, I, it's really cool to also see you build out from that one light set up and then how you can do so much with more lights, obviously but that attention to detail that you're uh, making happen. And I also love the, the conversation on getting it there in camera as much as possible. I mean, you're doing some compositing as well, but it's, it's, to me, it's also always good to spend some time getting as much of the details right in camera so you do spend less time editing it. <laughs> yeah, I hate, hate, hate editing, hate it very much. <laughs> I was going to talk about gels when you were talking about gels and uh, I was like, I love gels. <laughs> I have a ton of I, fun with gels. Um, I suck at gels. I don't well, know why you just got to spend more time with gels. <laughs> um, I tried, man. Man, I get so frustrated with gels. I don't know what it is. I just, I'm really bad a, at gels. <laughs> maybe it's just not your jam. That's what I'll do. I'm, you know what? That's going to be my quarantine thing. I'll learn more about gels. There you go. That's, I mean, it's also a great time to uh, practice and learn new skills. Um, yep. So I have a couple more questions that are coming in, so I'm going to uh, go through those. So this is a loaded question, okay. maybe. How many shots do you take in a given session? Ah. <laughs> Honestly, it's like 50. Okay. <laughs> I don't, but that goes I don't into shoot the planning, right? Um, that goes into the planning and I the want, preparation. I'm done. Yeah. I'm, I, 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 the shoot is over. Ne okay. Next next project or something. Um, I'm usually pretty quick to wrap up a shoot. So 50 to 100 at the most. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of lighting questions from Rick Gordon, who's tuning in. Um, hi, Rick. <laughs> uh, Rick's actually somebody I know, so that's pretty cool. Um, so when you say bare bold, that's basically you're using the mono lights without any kind of modifier. Is that correct? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For just, those tuning just, uh, in. Not, typically not um, either like a little seven inch reflector that's you know standard, or just nothing on the light at all, and just okay. letting it spill everywhere. Okay. Cool. And are you, for like rim lights, are you using any kind of grids or just that little reflector to give it some direction or sometimes no reflector? Uh, I, uh, I don't use grids too often. Um, I'm using the little two by one, one by two Westcott soft or uh, strip boxes, which are small enough that kind of keeps the light focused. Um, okay. So usually I'm just using a strip or a, just a strip box on either side. And I don't mind if the light kind of creeps in a little bit. Yeah. I don't need to be so concise with my light. It's okay if it, it creeps around a little bit. So yeah, typically it's that. I also don't want to use a grid that's going to make the light uh, power be so much weaker too. It really kind of crushes your, your light source power. Right. Um, so one more question from Rick. Uh, how long does it typically take to set up a shot? Maybe like that uh, bowling alley shot. How much time do you think you spent? I know you spent some time planning, but how much time do you think you spent on set that day, getting all the lights set up and dialed in and all of that. Sure. Bowling shot on that day was probably three to four hours of, from start to finish, three hours of that probably was the setup with makeup and hair and things like that. Outside of that, there was probably four or five site visits as well. Um, learning what the, this the place look like like I, I know every inch of that bowling out at this point um, right <laughs> so about four hours and 30 minutes of that was probably actual shooting okay and then I guess he's also asking a little bit when you're doing the, the traffic cone thing uh, mm -hmm. is that gonna be a little bit more run and gun I would guess because yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's not legal right <laughs> <laughs> But it worked. <laughs> traffic cone yeah. works. People listen to traffic cones. I don't know what yeah, it is. People true. just listen to traffic cones. Um, you mentioned the fog spray, and I know some other photographers that have used this. And every time I see somebody do that, I'm like, oh, I should order some of that. Is there a 
a brand preference or is that, I mean, is there a place where you go specifically to buy it or is it just something you find on Amazon or? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Where is it? I used to have a can of it laying around somewhere. Lasers should carry that. Um, we should carry that. At maybe I don't. Um, it's just like, it's, it's called Atmosphere Effects. Um, but yeah, I bought a pallet of it. I have a ton of that stuff. I got I, you I, have I, an like a questionable pallet amount. Or just a box? I, I have a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I tried to fly with it one time. It did not go over well. Right. Yeah, happening. that would be a thing that I would order and have shipped to the location, probably. Yeah, it is yeah. legitimately a blowtorch. If you <laughs> like, it's, it's, so it's not going to work out. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, if we don't have any more questions, um, we can. Uh, I just want to thank you for your time and Westcott for having you here. Um, and Brian, I know uh, you're with us, but you're you've been super quiet. But I saw you on Facebook. Um, but you know we're just so grateful to Westcott uh, for having you with us today, Jonathan. Your work is really, really awesome and inspiring, and I love seeing all those different layers of details and those stories and that attention to detail and focus, like the flashlights and the fire and like just all that stuff. So it's it's um, really awesome to see that and hear you talk about how that was all created. So. Thank you, thank you so much. For yeah, that. this is great. This is a lot of fun. I appreciate it too. And thank you again to you guys and thank you to Westcott and hope everyone stays safe and gets a chance to shoot amidst all this craziness that's going on in the world right now. I know. Well, we're, we're finally starting to get into phase 1.5 here in Seattle, but in different counties, they're a little further along. Um, yeah. But yeah, the store is open Monday through Friday now. So if you want to come in and browse, you can. Limited capacity, of course, but you know we're here for you in a lot of ways. So uh, we'll talk about that more on the next session. So um, Jonathan, I just want to thank you again, and um, we truly appreciate your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and um, thank you so much. We're so grateful. Thanks, guys, and y'all have a good. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Uh, we will be having more of these sessions throughout the day today. We have a little break. Uh, but then we will go live with uh, Suzanne Stein of Fujifilm next. So uh, stay tuned for updates. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.